Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media. I'm Grant Abbott and today we're looking at making mobile game assets and this is a look at how I made the vault. This will be a time lapse with a commentary over the top giving hints and tips about how you can do hand painted stylized models for mobile games. If you want to know more about how to hand paint models then do look at the playlist and if you want to see more of me making these mobile game assets for Atlas Empires, then look at that playlist. Those playlists are in the description. Also check out my character course if you haven't already and keep an eye out for my new learn how to draw creating game art. You can see the concept art at the top right there. That was sent to me by Chris Handlauser, the lead artist, and I had to convert this into a sort of mobile game asset by hand painting and obviously modeling and lowering the poly count and so forth. And you can see very basic shapes as always, as I always say, uh, keep it really nice and simple, keeping the polygon count down low. So when you add your objects, make sure you change it so that they've got a low amount of polygons. You could argue that the cylinders there are a little high. I could have probably gone a little bit lower with the poly count on those. When I say poly count, I do mean the faces of the object. And you can change that when you do bring objects in at the very start. But as soon as you edit them, you can't change them again. Uh, and also people always saying, oh, there's loads of n-gons in your shapes and you've got loads of overlap. Uh, why are you doing that? That's absolutely fine. You can have n-gons on a planar surface, so a very flat surface. There's no problem there and you won't see any distortion. It all gets turned into triangles in the end anyway. So uh, just make sure that uh, you can either triangulate it yourself to start with and uh, then you know that exactly what it's going to look like. But the render engine triangulates it anyway, so when you take it into the game engine, it triangulates it. But if you do it yourself, you know exactly where those triangles are going to be placed. But if they're on a flat surface, like I say, it makes no difference, so it's just not important. Occasionally, I do turn things into quads just for the sake of texture painting. It can be a bit awkward when it comes to long, thin triangles. Also, you don't want to do too much overlap where you've got wasted UV space, so that's painting space on your UV maps, and you don't want to have lots of extra faces on the inside and things like that. But generally speaking, it doesn't really make that much difference if you have a tiny bit of overlap, it's not going to matter to the performance at all. So if you want to learn how to make these sort of low poly assets, then do take a look at my cottage tutorial, my low poly well, and there's plenty of other playlists on my channel. So look in the playlist section and you can find out how to make these sort of models. It's the texture painting that's kind of the hard bit, I would say. That takes a bit longer to learn. I have got tutorials about that as well, so do look, check out the playlist like I said at the beginning. There's also my Fantasy Castle playlist as well that you can work through if you want to learn these things. I suppose the skill of this is knowing how detailed you need to go with the polygons. So uh, when it comes to texture painting, things like circles and cylinders are really awkward for trying to keep the poly count polygon count low, but you do get with experience, you get used to how many polygons you need in order to make things look rounded. Uh, but generally speaking, actually, with your designs, you probably want to steer clear of rounded shapes if you're very concerned about the polygon count. Lots of people do ask me about how many polygons is okay. It really depends on the asset and how close it is to the camera, how important it is in the scene. So things right in the background can be really low poly. It's a bit like LODs, so level of detail. So the closer things get to the camera, the more detail they have, and the further away, the less detail they have. So you've got to consider those sort of things, uh, how many shapes and objects are in your scene. So if you've got loads and loads, then you probably need to go to a very low poly style. So it all depends on the game. It's very difficult question to answer that one. Having said that, I was quite surprised about the amount of polygons I was allowed to use. They, there wasn't a set count, uh, but I just sort of kept creating things and adding more polygons and they didn't complain. So uh, I slowly learned uh, what I could add and uh, what I didn't have to worry about. These ropes going around the barrel were a bit of a pain. I'm trying where possible to only have to paint one object and then duplicate it and then bake it afterwards. Uh, it's a bit of a complicated process that and it's something you don't really need to worry about as a beginner uh, but I'm trying to reduce the uh, texture space down to a minimum and make the most of my time. So where possible where there's any repetition I'm trying to just do that once and then bake it onto the other objects. Uh, it's debatable sometimes as to whether that's quicker or not. This time I thought I'd show you the unwrapping process and often I do an actual UV smart UV project uh, to make it quicker but uh, for this shape it made sense to do a UV unwrap so I could go around kind of checking the objects at the same time make sure there wasn't any overlap and all that sort of thing. 
And when I say overlap, I mean uh, extra faces that I don't need. So there's a few times you can see me deleting the faces on the backside uh, where they're not important. It's only a few faces. It probably wouldn't make that much difference, but I do like to optimize it as much as possible. And now you can see me setting up for texture painting. So it's just one texture and they all share that texture and we start painting on them. But again, those objects that are repeated so that are instances, they share a UV space, I only have to paint them once. Chris didn't give me any particular colors for this one. So I just assumed a vault with a bit of sort of brass and silver and that sort of thing and metals. This seemed fairly obvious. That's probably why he didn't uh, give me any particular colors. I think as our sort of relationship, the professional relationship grows, they get more confident with me. Uh, so they can kind of give me less to go on and uh, know that I'm going to make a good result. So uh, they can kind of give me less and less uh, guidance as we go through. And it's quite fun. I've been uh, sort of experimenting more uh, with the designs they give me uh, and sort of offering a bit more. So there's a bit more back and forth, a bit more of me being involved in the actual creative process rather than just building what I'm told as it were. You can see these sort of plates I decided to paint them on uh, first of all uh, thinking that would be the best way and then later on I changed my mind because I think it's actually better if it does stick out from the mesh slightly. So I get a fair way down the process here um, of painting this plate uh, that sort of gone to the side of the vault here and there's a few of them and I, I really didn't think it was going to work quite with me painting them on like this. It didn't stick out uh, kind of enough in my mind so I thought I'm going to go back and model those and it's it's kind of bad practice to do that certainly and it takes a fair bit of experience to figure out how you're going to map the UVs or whether you're going to bake them and oh, it's a huge pain to change things after the fact uh, so uh, I would thoroughly recommend steering clear of what I'm doing here <laughs> but uh, I did um, I looked around my UV space and thought, is there any areas that I can use uh, and then I can re-unwrap this section and put it into this space. And there was a big section at the front where I'd uh, overlapped a face. So I thought I can cut that face out. It creates a big section and I can actually go in and edit these areas. But um, this is, uh, like I say, bad practice really because uh, it's just a pain to undo lots of paintwork that you may have already done. So I was try trying to find shortcuts to do that. Uh, and didn't have to do it in the end, just by creating extra bits and uh, fiddling around with the UVs. But again, you don't want to move any UVs that you've already painted. So yeah, it was a huge, uh, huge uh, pain, but um, it turned out okay in the end. Uh, as like I say, it's a, a bit of experience there in terms of uh, moving around UVs and knowing what you can get away with. These can be more of a pain to model. When you've got something sort of attached to something else and it has to follow around the curve, you have to really try and match the uh, edges up. Otherwise, they'll sort of intersect each other. It's kind of hard to explain that, but uh, you'll probably come across it at some point where you're trying to uh, map something around the edges. Make sure the, the edges, the edge count uh, matches and then they won't intersect. But <laughs> you'll, you'll know it when you see it, if you ever do this sort of thing. So we've gotten a lot of practice at painting these plates by now, <laughs> so this is my second time through. And uh, the rivets though, uh, in this case, I'm actually just painting those on, that's absolutely fine. They're, they're so small and they won't be seen particularly big on the screen, you do have to consider that. Although a lot of the time I'm probably going a bit over detail, but I'd rather do that uh, assuming that someone's going to be playing the game on something like an iPad or um, a tablet or something uh, rather than just a mobile phone so that maybe they've got a sort of bigger screen and hopefully that will give a bit more longevity to the game as well uh, and I won't have to sort of recreate models uh, for a bigger screen. Uh, so you do have to bear that in mind to make it a bit future-proof I suppose um, by adding enough detail that it's not sort of uh, really low quality when you zoom into it. Painting metal is uh, quite tough in some cases. The highlights need to be much smaller, so they're really sort of glinting and glowing uh, with bits of light. Uh, so yeah, keep your highlights small and quite strong highlights as well, so uh, they're very bright. Uh, the Color Dodge is a lovely brush for metal. I only really discovered that recently, so some of the earlier models don't have as good a um, met metallic look, I would say, um, especially when it comes to the colors. Uh, so coloured metal, so things like brass or gold. Uh, silver is still quite hard because you get more of a white highlight with silver, but um, you've also got to consider the reflections as well uh, with metal. So uh, where it's sort of um, touching another object, then maybe borrow some colour from that. 
So yes, do consider the objects surrounding the object you're painting, especially if it's metal and if it's got any reflective qualities. It does make a difference. It's hard sometimes, especially if you're doing duplicates and you want to uh, paint just one of them and move them around. Obviously, they're not going to reflect the same thing. So, And it also de depends on the environment you're in. Often I do think about the shadows at the bottom of the object and give them a bit of a green tint uh, because I feel like that's going to be the grass sections. Uh, but I have to be a little bit wary because you never know quite what the base is going to be uh, depending on what the uh, game designers want that um, section to be. So I'm not doing uh, the bases in this case as in the ground this is. Uh, so I have to consider that and think about that. Again, this door of the vault here, or this sort of section of the door anyway, uh, I'm painting that on so it doesn't have a bump to it. It's very unlikely we'd see it right from the side on a perfect angle, uh, but if you do, then it will look a little bit odd. Uh, but from the viewing angles, uh, you can get away with painting uh, height onto an object. So it's a bit like you're painting a bump map in a way, uh, but you're doing it with light and dark. The same way uh, the computer would. Uh, so when you do a, a bump map, it's calculating the light bounce. Uh, so you're just painting uh, that the light bounce and crevices and things like that. Another thing that you might notice me doing is jumping from viewing uh, in the shader editor. You can see that at the moment it's connected up to the viewer node. So that's an emission node. But sometimes I jump between the viewer node, which is an emission node, to the principal BSDF because then I can see the edges. And that's when I jump to the BSDF. So occasionally if you just look out for it and it goes a different shade and you can suddenly see all the edges and the flat edges this is, uh, that's because I'm moving across to the principal BSDF just like I am here. So I can go around with the edges just there and then jump back to the viewer node and the viewer node takes away those edges because it's giving an emission shader. Hard to explain, but again, you, you sort of get the idea when you start doing this. So jump between the viewer node and the principal BSDF. And that's using the node wrangler with control shift left click on whatever you want to go through the viewer node. In the end, you always shade smooth your entire object because your painting should do the work uh, of those sort of highlights and edges and so forth. You don't really want any flat, sharp edges coming from the model. Again, it comes from your painting. So all the time when you're painting, you're thinking about where the areas, areas of shade and where are the highlights on your object. You paint those in. Then when you shade it all flat and uh, give it an emission shader, uh, which is an emission of one, which is so it's got no influence of any lighting, uh, that's when you get your sort of perfect looking uh, model. <laughs> It's worth pointing out that in the playlist, the painting playlist, I've got lots of different um, objects that I paint. So that will give you an idea of how to paint things like the wood that I'm painting here and obviously the metal that I talk about. And they're much more sort of follow along type tutorials rather than commentaries over the top like this. That's probably worth saying as well that if you have any ideas or you want to know how I'm doing a certain thing, then I can make a separate tutorial on that. Uh, so just uh, give us a comment below if you've even got this far. If you've got this far, then you're probably interested in the painting process, so you uh, might have some ideas and comments that you can put in the comment section. Uh, you can see there that I was struggling to paint on an object, and that's because the normals were the wrong way, so the faces were facing the wrong way. And you can go into the overlay section and uh, tick on face direction, and that will tell you anything in red uh, is the back of the object, and you can't paint on that. Lots of people have that problem with painting. Here I'm doing a few character elements, so some dinks and scratches and things. Uh, they're quite easy once you get the hang of those. You just do a shadow and then think about where the light's coming from and give it a highlight uh, as to where that light is coming from. It's, uh, it's, it sort of seems easy to explain but um, hard to do and get right sometimes. Uh, but it is uh, there's a me method to it all. You can see here I'm attached to the principled BSDF and then go back to the viewer node and it really does give it a different shade and because it's flat shaded I can see all those edges nice and easily. These finer individual elements do tend to take quite a long time. The shortcuts I'm using to help me out are things like uh, the mirror tools. You can see them at the top, the X, Y and Z at the very sort of top bar there. Um, so when I'm painting on one side of the shape, it's appearing on the other and I start off using a lot of the mirror and then take it away later on so it doesn't look really symmetrical and uh, obviously mirrored. Um, occasionally as well I actually use uh, mirrored UVs so uh, 
I can save on texture space, so I actually use the mirror modifier. Uh, but when you're doing that, you have to be very careful um, when you're doing things like character elements, because if you put a dink on one side, it will appear on the other, and then it looks really obviously symmetrical, um, and that doesn't look as good. Um, asymmetry is very nice and natural looking. Um, so you steer clear of that where you can, but you use it for speed. Um, and where you can, you don't use the mirror modifier when unwrapping. You can use it when modeling to speed the process up again, um, but of course, uh, on the unwrap, that's quite important to separate it out or apply the mirror, I should say. You can see the legs of this um, uh, steps they are and the platform at the top. Uh, they were instances, so when I was painting one, it was updating on the other. I'm doing that for, for these individual models. Um, I can get away with not doing too many instances, but just the small areas that aren't really noticeable, uh, keep those as instances, uh, and then, you, uh, then I'm okay. And uh, like I say, it's not too noticeable. Uh, but on the bigger sets, I have to use lots of instances because I'm trying to save that texture space. It does speed up the workflow as well, so there is that advantage, but it's mainly about the texture space on my um, map, my texture map. Because those areas are sharing those UVs, then we, don't, we only need to paint them once. You can get away with adding tiny little sections like this if you've got a bit of space on your UV map. There's usually always a tiny bit of space that you can um, sort of map uh, one new little small object and get away with it. Uh, but generally speaking, it's very uh, poor practice to uh, add things in at this late stage. I suppose that's one of the tricky things about being a sort of texture artist like this. You do have to plan ahead a lot and really think carefully about what it's going to look like when it's been painted and uh, the effects of the paint on the model and so forth. So it does take a bit of experience, this uh, particular style of asset. Again, you can see me jumping to the principal BSDF for the barrel. And I think I'm using the mirror on this as well. Yes, I am. Uh, I've got the mirror tick so you can see it jumping across the other side. Uh, so I'm only painting half of it. And then I turn the mirror off to do those highlight sections. So the top of the barrel is going to be lighter. The bottom is going to be more shade. Uh, we always sort of think about a 12 o'clock shadow. So as if the sun's coming right from above you. Uh, so things at the top are lighter and things at the bottom are darker. And you kind of exaggerate that in this stylized way. Now, ropes are a pain. <laughs> so I usually like to go across to my UV editor and paint it in there. I say it's the UV editor. It's now the image editor and the UV editor is separate. Uh, but you can see I sort of uh, jump between that and the viewport, uh, making sure it looks okay. But that's the easy way is to go across the, your image editor and paint in there. And so make sure your UVs are nicely lined up for this sort of thing. And I suddenly realized I hadn't put any metal bits in for this barrel, so I had to draw those in. Uh, it, and you could, I could have modeled those, but I think it looks all right um, as it is. And there we have it, the finished model. It took quite a long time in terms of the painting process, this one, but I'm really pleased how it turned out. I much prefer doing these sort of individual models because you can really go for it in terms of the highlights and shadows and things rather than having to do lots of instances. So there is a bit more sort of fun to it and uh, perhaps creativity as well. If you got all the way to the end, thanks for your support and do comment below with any thoughts and ideas that you might have for the channel. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.